The central United States is the tornado's playground. Meteorologists come from all over the world because this is where they happen. From Texas all the way up to Nebraska and into Canada is what's known as Tornado Alley. And usually starting in early April through the summer is what they call the storm season. year storm that's coming. We were in the hottest tornado spot in the world at the hottest tornado time, and it was scary. I want the audience to feel the same amazement as what the storm chases feel. Get us out, get us out of here. Okay, we're in the window. Here we go. Okay. In the summer of 1995, during the heat of storm season, the director of Speed, Jan de Bant, along with producers Kathleen Kennedy, Michael Crichton, and Ian Bryce, set out to capture the dark side of nature on film. The result is Twister, the latest film from Steven Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment. It tells the story of two recently separated meteorologists, played by Helen Hunt and Bill Paxton who were brought together again by the threat of the 50-year storm, a deadly system that threatens to drop multiple tornadoes into central Oklahoma. The NSSL says the cap is breaking. Towers are going up 30 miles off the dry line. All right, let's go. I'm playing this woman who's, while everyone else is scared and running away from a storm, she wants to, like, see inside of it and go toward it, and fear is just not in her, in her vocabulary. For these storm chasers, it's the chance of a lifetime, an opportunity to launch a tracking device nicknamed Dorothy that can unlock the secrets inside nature's most mysterious killer. We put her up inside a tornado. She opens and releases hundreds of these sensors that measure all parts of the tornado simultaneously. I'm a guy who walked away from it. I'm a gunfighter who left the gunfight. When I go back to see my ex-wife, Helen Hunt, to get the divorce papers signed, I've got my fiance in tow. I realize that since I've seen her, she's become even more obsessed. Did you sign papers? She didn't? Come on, you can still catch him. sort of hold them ransom if he goes on this one final chase with me. Dusty, the battle zone should be northeast of 81. Got Wait a minute, know. the battle zone? Billy, what are we doing? We're going again. It's very fun to get to play a relationship that's already fueled by a lot of rage and love and a mixed bag of emotion. OK, guys, let's go get it. Add to this mix a rival storm chasing team headed by Carrie Elways dead set on getting to the twister first, and you have the makings of an incredible, terrifying ride. It's that cat and mouse chase with the weather, with this great ominous thing that these storm chasers deal with, and that's where the rush comes from. People tend to say that speed was a very fast-moving picture. I think this one is a little quicker. <laughs> Traveling hundreds of miles throughout Tornado Alley, the line between the script, written by Michael Crichton and Anne-Marie Martin, and reality, began to blur. The production found itself surrounded by the same violent weather they were portraying on screen. We could see on our portable Doppler that we had a supercell moving toward us. And in fact, not only was it moving toward us, it was literally bearing right down on us. It's exhilarating because what's happening around you is completely and totally beyond your control. The night before we started shooting, there was an awesome thunderstorm, thunder and lightning storm. And as an actor, you always hope that there'll be some omen that you were born to play the part or that you're you know, perfectly suited. The night before this movie started, I was lying in my bed going, if there were a tornado coming, I would run the other way. Lightning came out, and man, it was the loudest storm, and it was really powerful. The idea of people going out there chasing tornadoes tells you a lot about a person. On the very same day the Twister cast and crew hit the road, their real life counterparts, the storm chasers from Vortex, had their sights set on the real thing. 
an offshoot of the National Severe Storm Lab, the team of scientists was tracking a massive storm system that had formed over the Texas Panhandle, just south of the production. The mission today is to uh, document the near-tornado thermodynamic fields. Using a caravan of 20 vehicles, two airplanes and a command vehicle manned by the team leader, Eric Brasmussen, the Vortex team was able to pinpoint the tornado's touchdown, a terrifying place where in the middle of the day, it looks like night. Uh, uh, it's still too dangerous for us to get out. There's an adrenaline rush to doing all this. You know, some guys like to go and, and, and surf the bonsai pipeline. Some guys are into hang gliders. These guys are into chasing tornadoes. And it's almost like chasing a rogue murderer. It's one of the most terrifying sights a human being can witness. Almost 345 degrees. The tornado we saw Friday was so strong that it peeled the asphalt off of a, of a highway and threw it 600 feet out through a field. Chris, that telemetry, we need emergency crews here. Uh, houses have been hit over. Oh, get, us out, get us out of here. I'm serious. I know. Not only have the storm chasers of Tornado Alley begun to unravel the physics behind the violent storms, through the increased use of video cameras, they have also captured some of the most terrifying images ever seen. It was this kind of urgency combined with the excitement of discovery that Jan de Bont wanted to capture in Twister. The production became its own storm chasing unit, ready on a moment's notice to move if the weather was right, or in this case, wrong. I wanted to have this feel, feel of a, almost like a documentary that like those guys are really doing. They had this one day, and then this day they have to get there. And it gives it a very unique look to the movie. We're driving due east on the country road. He's been on for about six miles. We got an F3 tune sitting on the ground. Woohoo! I always feel that beauty gets in the way of the content, and I want to forget the beauty. I want to just go right to the heart of the story. We're getting slammed in here, guys. You better hang back. Time for deployment, guys. Let's do it. Sometimes when I didn't know what to do with this character, I decided I was playing Jan. Just, just focused and fearless. To recreate the violence of winds that can reach 300 miles an hour, DeBant again went for realism. Bring the wind up. Using the jet engine from a 707, massive fans, and even a turning rig that allowed Bill and Helen to be swept up by the force of the tornado. I knew reading the script it wasn't going to be, you know, like a easy picnic of a shoot. Scenes when Helen and Bill drive straight into the storm, DeBont rigged up a caravan of semi trucks spewing debris and ice chunks over the camera car and onto the actor's truck. Just before the tornado happened, these others used hailstorm. So I said, I have to have a real hailstorm scene in the movie. I wish I'd never thought about it. We couldn't get any hail in, in all of Oklahoma, so we had to import it from a neighboring state. We had like four or five 40 foot trailers moving at the same time. Ten seconds later, all the ice is gone, all the debris is gone, and we have to go back to one. It took forever to shoot that scene. Stand by to roll. All right, guys, everybody knows this truck's going to be barely running through here, so nobody should be close to the side of the road. Let's pull out, everybody, please. Everybody pull out. Ice out. Well, here we are. This is pretty real. I don't have to do a lot of acting in, in this movie. You know, they're raining basically chipped ice on me. They're throwing debris. I mean, although it's it's lightweight stuff, it still hits, it still hurts. It's exciting stuff. This is why I signed up. It's a very physical role. Okay, she's almost ready! Hold on! We're almost there! We're almost there! It really looks like the end of the world. They built a set using existing buildings and buildings they built for the establishing shot, and then they tore down. I'd say it was seven square blocks, and they just reduced this place to rubble, and they had got literally cars and trees, and they um, copied a lot of famous tornado photographs. 
for blocks and blocks and blocks. We were walking through rubble up to our knees. It was just really bizarre. We need some hanging wires, electric power lines that can spark so that when we look this way behind them, there's a shower of sparks behind them. They had no warning. Even just to create very, very small scenes took a phenomenal amount of manpower and equipment. And it really made all of us step back and realize how nature itself can create this on such a massive scale. And we were putting all our energy into just creating what would exist in the frame. This is Topeka, Kansas. And this is the aftermath of the most destructive tornado ever to strike the state capitol. It sliced a path of death and damage a half mile wide and 15 miles long. Tree just blew over. The nature of the tornado and the reason it is able to destroy so much so quickly is that it is completely unpredictable, able to turn on the observer in the blink of an eye. It was this unpredictability that led DeBont to Industrial Light and Magic, the computer effects facility owned by George Lucas. It was a rare chance to control the uncontrollable. It should be a lot lower. We wanted to make it be as realistic as possible. We have so many tapes of real tornadoes, but always, again, seen from a distance. You never see the inside of a tornado, which we hopefully going to see for the first time in this movie. It's kind of really a new wave in terms of saying we can do everything in the computer because all the cars that are flying, all the houses, you know, the, the spinning house onto a road, and, and all the tanker and everything, that's all computer graphics. Are you going to make this then? The quality of computer imaging and the CGI is so incredible right now that you almost have to. Um, make it look like there were little mistakes in it. It's too perfect almost. We add the level of shake to it so that it builds up. The closer the tornado comes, the more intense that shake becomes. It's in the eye of the beholder, you know, whether it's a monster that's coming to get you or a force of nature to be listened to or something fascinating or something terrifying. I think what makes it a good thing to make a movie about is it's all of those things. If they just get 10% of that feeling, then you still will be enormous, it will be still fantastic. <laughs> we as, as, as a society, uh, people just in general have an innate fascination with these storms, these, these tornadoes are just so captivating to look at. And here we're throwing the audience right into the middle of them, and uh, it's going to be it's going to be a hell of a ride. Is real. The terror is unimaginable. And destruction is imminent. You're at the mercy of one of Mother Nature's most erratic and destructive children, the tornado. Tighten your seatbelt. To witness a tornado is a spectacular sight. To live through its wake is another story. Join us as we take a thrilling ride into the eye of a storm. What occurs is kind of like what occurred in April 3rd and 4th of 1974, what they call a super outbreak, where tornadoes from a storm system were literally 148 tornadoes were formed and dropped over about 11 state area, killing about 350 people. And so the tornadoes start out fairly small, 
but then each one becomes progressively larger and they kind of herald the king. The filmmakers of Twister went to great lengths to recreate the destructive nature of actual tornadoes. I wanted to, 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 to get a very realistic look of it. I looked at tons and tons of films, of documentaries, about those tornado chases and about what sort of tornadoes look like. And, and it's all very rough. And I wanted to get the feeling you now for the audience that they were really participating in this movie, that they were making the same kind of trip, you know, through all those, those, those wild circumstances to get there. The realistic environments created by the art and special effects departments enabled the cast to experience the violent unpredictability of a severe storm front. Just to walk around that and just see how close it looks to the footage that, that I've seen, it's uncanny. And I think even the locals are kind of stunned. They're like looking around, they're going, my God, I guess this is what would happen if a tornado hit us. What a movie like this does, it only gives you more respect for nature. Because as you're trying to duplicate just a little tiny scene, what it is you have to put into that to even come close to what the actual event would look like is phenomenal. Creating the spectacular sets and practical effects were only one piece of the puzzle. Visualizing the various twisters that were called for in the script proved to be a formidable challenge. An F5, which is like the most powerful tonight, they can go more than a mile wide, and this wind speed of up to 300 miles an hour inside the core, which is like two to three times as strong as the biggest hurricane, and I totally pulverized everything. Nothing was left. It's like nothing even existed before. So the power is un unbelievable. What I think Jan has done to bring people as close to a tornado as you'd ever want to get without ever having to hurt yourself whatsoever. And it's ominous. I mean, the footage that ILM has done, it's wild. It's just a wild ride. This challenge to create the over 300 intricate visual effect shots needed for the film was taken on by Stephen Fangmeyer and his fellow wizards at George Lucas's Industrial Light and Magic in Northern California. We have done a lot of testing before we started the movie because we wanted to make absolute sure that we could do that in a realistic way. And the test turned out to be very good, very successful, and that kind of convinced us to make the movie, basically. Kind of another breakthrough, which is kind of nice, because the movie being shot in a documentary way, the effects has to have the same feeling to it. It's, it's very, very hard to do. Before production began, painstaking research was conducted to make sure that the tornadoes depicted in Twister would look and react like their real-life counterparts. I think every sequence has a different looking tornado and there's a lot of reference out there and what we have found that hardly any tornado in that reference, which are mostly sort of home videos, unfortunately because quality isn't so great that we can just imagine what the thing would look like if you ever captured anything on high quality film. But there's a lot of range out there, so we spend a lot of time looking at those tapes and figuring out, okay, what is interesting about particular tornadoes. It starts out as a line, a tornado would be much as its spine sort of moving along and we often determine the speed, the travel of it, also its sort of movement, how does it deform on, on this axis, animating just that, that spine so to speak. And then we fill in with the particles the motion of the debris and the, the, the air molecules around that spine. Since a lot of our work previously has been that we model a certain surface, like a creature, like a T-Rex, now with a tornado, a tornado isn't really a, a confined surface like that. And it's just sort of dust moving around. You really have to show that it's made out of, out of billions of trillions of little particles and have them all behave by a certain rule set with, of course, some turbulence built in. So it's really moving a lot of particles and, and clumps them together to make it look at, with the different color ranges to sort of make it look like debris. Once the initial wireframe models were created and approved, they became fully realized, taking on color, form, and texture. All the live action elements were then combined to form a finished or composite shot. Creating realism and scope was essential to the filmmakers. Besides generating the actual twisters, objects such as tractors, tankers, and even a cow, which normally would be impossible to capture and control, were easily created in the computer environment. Sometimes, even Mother Nature needs to be pushed. ILM also enhanced numerous scenes, transforming picture-perfect shooting days into storm-filled ones. 
Each stage of the process was then presented to director Jan de Bon for his approval. After months of intense post-production, the Twister team at ILM finally let their efforts speak for themselves. And Jan is really sort of, his curve just keeps on going up, you know, until the end of the film. And his dynamics is the ones, you know, he says go, you know, really got to keep that level up in the film. So every shot, more or less, really has to be pretty pumped up. And that's kind of fun, when, once you get into that spirit and understand it, it's kind of fun to just sort of play everything out that way. And it's really a different way. It feels, in some way, more like you're going on a ride and I think it makes our work with Jan so excellent, you know, our cooperation is that we sort of understand his style. And I think he appreciates also all the things we can put in that he just on, on location could have never planned out at that point in time or really executed there. Yeah. Okay. What makes Twister so exciting, I think, is the fact that tornadoes are unpredictable and they shoot down at any moment and you're chasing it. You're basically chasing the weather. It's man against nature. You basically drive in the car at one point. You're one of those guys, the audience is one of those chasers and, 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 and trying to search for that tornado. It's like we all want to see, want to be close to danger. We don't get too close, but close enough so that to get the adrenaline going. I think whenever you can deal with phenomenal natural events, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, fires, things like that, we tend to think of them as being extraordinarily beautiful at the same time that they're extremely dangerous. And in this case, tornadoes are incredibly fascinating. And the minute you see the sky and the lightning and then the formation of a tornado, you can't take your eyes off. Generally, it's very difficult to move up in Hollywood. Originally, I started as a director in Holland. But coming here, I had to start all over again, you know? And, and, and so the best way to start was as a cinematographer. But they kept asking me to do more movies. And said, listen, I want to go back to what I, how I started my career. And I found that script speed. And once the movie was successful, then it's a little easier. And then, of course, um, that's when I saw the, the script of Twister. I thought, wow, this is so completely up my alley. Tighten your seatbelt. At the time, you know, that movie had so many effects in it, and nobody had ever done those effects. So the whole idea was, if we could prove to the studio that we could make those effects and make them look real, not just like a little wind machine, and then hopefully it looks like a twisted. So we, we did a test with uh, ILM. It took a long time and you know, a lot of different efforts. This one for PH13, huh? Mm -hmm. Can be done there? They had to actually basically invent new software because nothing existed. The front of the real place. I was working with Dennis Mern on Casper, another Amblin production, and Steven Spielberg had approached Dennis Mern um, to do a test for Twister, which Steven always likes to do. We did one with Habib Zagapur, a guru at Industrial Light and Magic, who also became sort of my rent hand guy on Twister. We did the test and showed it to the studio, and they loved it. But it was so dynamic that people wanted to use it for the trailer and to market the movie. The script wasn't even quite finished yet, but when they saw the shot, we have to do that, and we have to do it now. Casting for this movie, I thought, was gonna be the most important thing that I had to do, because I felt like if this movie is not cast right, audiences are not gonna believe it. I really was very convinced that it couldn't be big stars. I wanted to find actors that are really good and that looked like they could be a student, could be a scientist, could be like an obsessed, you know, student. 
so that you would get a group, an ensemble that is interesting to look at, you know? They're hip, they're a little crazy because you have to be crazy. We know where Jonas is? Yeah, he's still in Mills. It's more than 30 miles Thanks, from it. Thanks, Thanks, he's moving. Can we beat us? I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas. So that's part of Tornado Alley. I remember line storms, and Jan DeBont and I bonded on the film. My first meeting with Jan was in the morning, and I came in, my hair was short. His biggest concern, would my hair grow out in time? Because Bill, I want you to have, you have to have the hair for the wind to blow. I, I you know, I, the short hair, it's, it's no good for me. Okay, Jan, I go, my hair grows real fast. He really wanted to know if I was up for the physical punishment of this movie. Bill Paxton, you know, I knew the, the physical difficulties you would run into in making the movie. So I needed an actor, you know, who was not a whiner. <laughs> and once you're willing to deal with that, it's fantastic. Okay, guys, let's go get it. I needed a very strong female talent, somebody who really, you also could believe she's a scientist, she's a strong individual, I mean, she's pushy, she still has a heart, it has a sense of humor, it's physical and, and, and gutsy, and, and who could also be a leader. And you're sitting in the middle of it. <laughs> but they came up with like millions of names, and I said, no, it's not it, and I thought, uh, it has to be Helen Hunt. Are you going to go for it, Joe? I liked Helen. She has a feeling of a real Midwesterner in many ways, in, in her speech and in her manner. It was a fun kind of dance to play with her because we, we, we were lovers who had, fallen, who had fallen out. There was an unrequited love that was still there. We had to play out this dance. But she was up for it. She was cool. She's got a little tomboy in her. and. Uh, I liked her. I thought we had some chemistry together. I need therapy. I didn't say that. I need a therapist. I what could that. I possibly need a therapist for? I don't know. You're the doctor. Tell me. The key thing is that I had to establish a little bit who those people are, you know, because it's it's, it's really hard in the movie to follow a bunch of characters if you have no idea what they stand for. So I had to create early on in the movie a little scene for every character, a little bit. I have to introduce him. Hello. Nice to meet you. I think they are thrill seekers, but they are, they're scientists and they're trying to learn as much as they can in the hopes of saving lives. That's kind of the nature of, of the plot line of Twister. NSSL predicted an F5. You go stop it. And we had a great cast on Twister, so we were constantly trying to come up with little ways to be emotionally attached to these characters. I gave them some, you know, like specific things that had to be in there. Can I get way down there? Because I got the whole team behind me. No, 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 no. The team is not behind. You guys are way ahead of everybody. Way ahead of everybody. You're all by yourself. And other things that came more out of the personality because they could help me by making them unique. I have to start the movie that shows you honest right from the beginning that what you're gonna see is really impactful and, and what it can do to real human beings. And in this story, what happened in the beginning of the movie is basically something that happened in Helen Hunt's character in reality when she was a child. What I wanted to suggest is and show to the audience that the power of those tornadoes is so gigantic that it really can completely suck you out of there. And I didn't want to show the tornado, so you just get a little glimpse. When we did the original version of the movie, the, her father did not die. And Steven Spielberg, when he viewed the film, said, you know what, I think the best thing to do is her father has to die. He had to get swept up in the tornado. So when he was in the cellar, and he's protecting his family from the tornado, he's holding down the, the cellar door. And what we did was, we had him tied to the cellar door. And as, he's, as the door's flapping, of course, you know, the special effects guys are on the outside making the door flap. And then uh, on the queue, we had it all rigged on cables and counterweights, and we just pulled the door right off. But he was attached to the door, so he just went right with it, and he's gone. And we start our movie. When I started researching the role, I had read incredible stories of outbreaks of tornadoes. See, when I first got the job, I had to go and understand what the mesocyclone was. I tried to just steep myself full of this stuff. 
When you'd read the script, it was like, your line, my line, your line, run, run, almost get killed. Your line, my line, run, 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 almost get killed again. Just from reading the script, it was exhausting to think how much running, how much dodging, how much ducking. I loved it. I drove myself to location every day. I just remember the air and the sound of the metal larks and all of this stuff. And I couldn't have been happier making the film. Now, Jan is a very physical guy. He's pushing himself as hard as he'll push his crew and his actors. But I admired that. Cue her a little later. And I find that's exciting to me. It's a very tough thing making a movie like this. You have got to be up for the challenge. It's going to test your physical endurance. It's going to test your patience. It's going to test uh, everything. You know, you're fighting the schedule, the weather. When we started, which was a twist of season, we had such bad weather. We had four bulldozers and tractors only because every car got stuck in the mud. We had so many vehicles just to pull trucks, trailers, camera equipment out of mud, and it was horrific. This was the middle of twister season, but sometimes there were days we could shoot like maybe one or two shots. They got the entire crew together and they had the tornado people and, and they did like the safety seminar. It was like a three hour deal and we took it serious and you know, you'd be shooting and all of a sudden you'd get a tornado warning and if it was within five miles of us, you got to bring down all the cranes and all the uh, lights and you got to stop. As the movie progressed, it became really sunny. And sometimes, you know, in one location it's sunny and the other one is cloudy and the other one is it's completely gray and you all have to make it look the same. Jan wanted to push it as far as he could to really make the audience really believe that it was the actors doing all of their own stunts. One of my responsibilities as a visual effects supervisor is always to work very closely with a special effects supervisor and that's a person who does all the practical stuff on set and John Frazier was just a great guy. He builds great stuff and he just has these wild ideas and uh, the wind machine that they had was a 707 jet motor mounted on a 40 foot truck with uh, another 40 foot container above it to push debris into it. I went out into the desert out in Mojave where they have the, the airplane graveyard out there. We said, um, okay, we're looking for a jet motor. And I said, turn that one on. And I said, nah, nah Jan's not gonna like that. I said, how about that big one over there? What size is that? They said, well, that's a Boeing 707. That sounds good. I like the sound of that. They fueled it up, fired it up, and I said, okay, I'll take two of those. So they literally took them off the wings of the airplane, and then we took them back to our facility in Sun Valley and mounted them on trucks. And when you're doing a movie like Twister, debris is what it's all about. Debris, we have debris! And whenever it's close to somebody, we will make it out of rubber or lightweight. What we did was we just had people go out and we just brought in stuff from recycling plants. And then we had to uh, clean it all. Anything that we had had to be all sanitized. We're off to see the weather. What we did was we just put a big box up on top of the jet motor and then we just literally got inside the box and we'd shovel the debris outside the box and then when it would fall, it would fall into the exhaust and then just propel it. We did a lot of traveling rain shots where we had three vehicles and the lead vehicle was a 4,000 gallon water truck. Then we had the insert car that had the camera crew on it. And then we had the picture car, which was the big red truck. We hooked all of them together and the water truck pulled everything. So, if you start your hill when you're on top of the bridge, the first part, aim it sideways. I remember when we started researching what we were gonna use for hail. We went into plastic ice cubes and this and that, and finally we got a few blocks of ice, these 300 pound blocks of ice, and we took a, an ice crusher that we normally use for snow. We altered it a little bit, slowed it down, and what came out of it was these big chunks of ice. So we put milk in each block of ice. That was the color in it, so it was opaque. Then we set up the machine and we did a test. Swami, how much ice we got left? We saw the footage and, and, uh, and it really looked cool. There were things where I suggested, okay, you definitely try to do this practically. And John is certainly a very hardy special effects supervisor. I mean, he will just about try anything. What is that? One of the most important things in the movie is to keep the combination of physical effects and visual effects 
in scale so that one doesn't jump out from the other. So, for instance, when the tanker gets lifted up by the twister and pulled up in the air and then falls down, that's for real. The big tanker truck we dropped from a crane. We made that whole tanker truck out of lightweight aluminum and lightweight rubber tires. And then we actually had it rigged so that it would swing into the pickup truck. And then from there, Stefan uh, Fangmeyer at, at ILM took over. When it comes out of the tornado and scrapes towards them, it was a CGI truck because that kind of movement you just couldn't do with a full-size truck. But then later on, of course, once it's gotten over them, it turn around and drive back, and it falls out of the sky and explodes. That was a real, you know, that was a real explosion. I think there were probably about 16 cameras on that. Yeah, there was over a thousand gallons of gasoline in that tanker truck. Actually, we did that twice. We had another tanker truck. A week later, we came back and and did it again, and you know, of course we wanted to do it again because it was just fun to see, you know. But I thought one of the ultimate things has to be that it really picks up a house and rolls it down the street. Oh my God. I had seen some footage of it, and you know, obviously you cannot do that for real. When it actually sort of tumbles across and then just sort of lands smack on the road, that is, of course, computer animated because there's no rig that you could use, even a huge crane or whatever, without immediately destroying the house. So there was a practical house that actually was put on the street. The truck drives into it. The front of the house was upright, but the back of the house was upside down. Well, the truck drives through the front door, but when it comes out the back, the house is upside down. So it looks like the house has done a 360 degrees revolution, when in reality, it never did anything. We had built sections of the set where the car would go in high speed. So it was basically six or seven different sets. It all takes place over a span of five or six weeks in different locations. Here we go. So it, it just takes a long time. And you know, there's, there's 20 different pieces in there. I thought that was such a fun thing to do. They went from bedroom, living room, kitchen, and came out on the other side. And then wrote, and it's like, what the hell just happened to this? But it was extremely complex to do. Mac! Careful, careful, this house could go any second. In those days, when we were there, it's actually not even that long ago, um, a lot of people were moving towards the city. So we found a lot of tiny little towns where very few people lived and I was looking for a space that, that could be used for that particular scene. Man, the art department did a great job. I think it was Wakita was the name of the town, and there were a lot of empty buildings that they, they really wanted to get rid of, and they were trying to rebuild. Basically what we used is the houses where nobody lived, we tore down and used them as set dressing, so it looked real. The art department just did a fantastic thing. Cars up in trees and houses destroyed. The exterior of the house was in, a, in, in the town called Wakita. And then to have control over the interiors, it was built on the inside of the soundstage. It was actually a warehouse that we found in Norman, Oklahoma. The more real it looked to me, the better the scene would work. And that, I think, makes that scene so fantastic, is that, like I said, the other night on TV again, it was like another one of those twister disasters. It gets completely flattened. Them running and then these fence posts becoming sort of projectiles at spear. That was shot on location. We spent uh, two or three months making the mechanism that was under the ground that would make that fence do that as they were running by it. And we just pushed this whole thing with air and it's just, as it's going by, Wherever there was a hole, the air would go up the hole and push the piece of the picket fence out. Put the projectiles in at the last minute. Oh, yeah. And then, then run into the big barn. It's full of farm implements that would just, you know, take your head off immediately. Oh my God, who are these people? So they run out of that again and finally run towards this little water pump shed. And in there, you know, knowing that the tornado was coming, tied themselves to the iron pipes there. There was a shot that Jan needed that we couldn't do on location, that we shot months later. And it required building this, this incredible, weird kind of Ferris wheel type of, of, of effect gantry that uh, I guess John Frazier figured out. When we were having our earlier meetings, 
there was a shot where the, the two characters get sucked up in the tornado. Ah! So they said, uh, well, anybody, you know, got any ideas how we're going to do that? So they said, you know, we can go back 50 years and like Fred Astaire dancing on the, on the walls. That sounded pretty archaic. Well, six months later, after we finished the movie, I get a call and I showed them what we'd do. We were literally put the set inside a big ring and attached the camera to it. And we, then we had a big fan underneath it. And then and it rode with it. So as that ring went around and the camera went with it, they actually were just like hanging upside down. But camera wise, it looked like they were going straight up into the eye of the tornado. The actors would go all the way to the top and then they really hang. And so it looks like they're being pushed from the top, which I had wind machines all around, so that as they got higher, the wind would come from the right direction. And that worked fantastic. Okay, having a look, let's stand by, please. Really the big thing about Twister that people might not realize, the way it was photographed was really uh, uh, quite much more dynamic and sort of uh, quite freer than visual effects before were really done. We really didn't do any blue screen for the movie at all. So all the things where we had to put the tornadoes behind the running people, it, it kind of comes down to digital paint work where you kind of rotoscope. It's very hard work, but I think it was absolutely necessary to make this film seem real, that you really were there. The most difficult thing in those days is what people don't remember, is that Originally, when you make a movie with facial effects in those days, you put the camera on a tripod, you lock it off, and you make very little pants. Well, there's one thing we're going to have to change. This camera will never be on a tripod because, you know, you cannot get a sense of danger and action and, and, and incredible change, quick changes, if I cannot put this camera on my shoulder. We made a lot of tests while we were shooting and see if we could do it. One other thing that I really enjoyed later on in post was actually when we had to come down to what those twisters are going to look like, is helping to design the look of the twisters. Now the thing we did certainly for research was to gather all the footage we could. The biggest problem was that of course it's very difficult to find any film footage because they are so unpredictable. Jan watched a lot of that obviously as well too, to really duplicate that experience of how chaotic it is and all the different elements in it. And so our approach was to sort of look at that and then say, okay, now how would that look on film? How does it fit in the landscape and where does it connect? Because if you don't have it connect, if you don't see this interaction between where it hits the ground and, and the ground itself, then it's not going to work. Then it becomes just like a an object that's just put in there. And that was difficult. They had sort of a storm unit that actually started filming, I think a month before, and drove down all the, the panhandle there from Oklahoma to Texas and to just get some footage of huge storm fronts. And we were able to use some of those. Where other sequences, for instance, Hailstorm Hill, where they're driving up the hill and then the hail starts happening, they try to get the Dorothy off the truck. That whole swirling sky enough, that was all computer generated because there was literally nothing up there but blue sky or gray sky at least, you know. And so sometimes we had to create it all and sometimes we were able to use something that was there as a sort of a starter kit. We do not have a visual, help us out here. We did have a lot of reference in, and there were a lot of different looks. They always do look different. It always depends also what they're going through, what kind of color earth they're picking up and you know how much water content is there and how much of a speed do they travel and the wind speed inside of them. So you try to use all of those and then it's really you know working with somebody like Jan also to articulate that. That one in the end was probably like a wall of elephants coming through. Run! Well, some of the other ones were much more elegant in a way. I thought the water funnels were sort of like, you know, you could sort of say like water fairies dancing out there in their own little mysterious dance. Now animating them really, it's actually a fairly simple task in terms of their movement because you're just really animating a little string around which you build the tornado. So in that terms of animation, it was in easy, but then creating the tornado around it was a hard part. 
instead of having a solid surface, you're really using a completely different approach to represent mass. I mean, the mass of a tornado, which is literally billions and billions and billions of particles. None of this existed when we started, and Twister was certainly the technology created for it, a tremendous foray for industrial light magic into using particle systems to that extent. What are you doing? What I really wanted to make sure is that the threat was growing. You know, during the course of the movie, the audience understands what it really means, a tornado. And you start with a small one. So you're taught a little bit what a small one can do. So you set up a little bit then what a bigger one could do. Whoa! I really wanted to create characters because they are talking to the Twister. Oh my God, take her! They see it as a character themselves. It's something they battle. So they take it personal. You've never seen him miss this house and miss that house and come after you. So it was for me very important to create a character for every different twister. Okay, we got sisters. You read a lot of different accounts of what happens in tornadoes, and I think there was really one where a farmer had said that he had missed some of his cattle and then it found, was found literally 20 miles away. So it was sort of reconstructed that the tornado had actually picked them up, but also put them back down in a relatively gentle fashion because they were still alive. And that's where the cow came from. I remember doing the flying cow sequence and Jan was trying to coordinate so that me and Helen and Jamie, our, our eye line is going the same way. The key thing is how do the actors relate to something they don't see because that's the one thing they could not see in the set. I could not on the set create the actual twister. So basically I kind of had to act it out, you know, and I, I was running around where the twister was and with bullhorns and and so that they had, the actors had something to react to. He goes, Bill, Bill, no, no, you're, you're not watching here. The cow is flying, here it comes, here it comes. Follow the hand, follow the fingers. It comes around, now it's coming around again. Now you're lying. Here comes the cow flying by again. It's so funny because that is such a popular moment in the movie, especially with young kids and stuff. They love the flying cow. I told Jan my version would be, in, in the gothic version, the cow would fly by once, and then you wouldn't see the cow again, then about 15 seconds it would just rain hamburger meat down on the car as the barometric pressure just exploded the cow. As a visual effects person, you really never hear the sound. It's moving fast! Coming towards you, Joe! Since that is going on in parallel, most of the time you don't really know it. And so I was very happy to hear then later on, you know, that that was such a successful combination. Although I was certain that would happen. I think it's really important that your antagonist has personality. And, and basically we have six of those, so, and that personality had to change. So I really felt very strongly about creating different sound effects for each one. And we started recording lots of different sounds and made a gigantic uh, library of sound effects. But we also started, started, we started recording lions, these, uh, all kinds of animal screams. Breaking boards, uh, big, um, like crashing cars into walls. And ultimately, all those things mixed and slowed down and mixed together, we started creating different effects. I wanted the tornado to talk to them. I wanted to, to get a sense like it's a living thing. But it was a really great effect because really the, uh, the theater was shaking. It's still really good. I think it's still one of the best sound effect movies in a long time. I think even at now it still holds up very, very well sound effect wise. Where is it? 
One of the great themes is man versus nature. It will always hold our fascination. There's a fear, there's also a sense of wonderment. The forces of nature are humbling to behold and terrifying. There's a fear of tornadoes like there is of sharks. It's a primordial thing. It's almost in our genetic code. People are fascinated. It's kind of like one of those things where you're afraid, but you're, you're almost so compelled by the awesome nature of, of seeing a tornado that you might become almost mesmerized by it to the point where you, you forget you're, you're in mortal danger. Get underground, take on right now, go! Having such a great cast and crew is the best memories of the making of the movie. They all were, were like a team, because everybody had the, the same struggle. Nobody had anything more than the other person. We all were the same, you know, it's like we spread over like God knows 30 little hotels and we still all have dinner together. It was, it was the best time and crew-wise and cast-wise, one of the best movies I worked on.